there may be some celebrity that is worth you paying for you to build a relationship with them. So you're like, hey, I want to book A-Rod and spend 150 to $250,000, which is, may sound crazy, but now you get into business with him because he owns 19,000 real estate units. You're what I would call like a master connector. You're probably that one connection away from almost anyone. I would have DJ Khaled or Kim Kardashian or Kylie Jenner or whoever post about Fit T, Fashion Nova, Pretty Little Thing, or general brands like Lyft, Postmates, et cetera. Like how did you even build relationships with Kim Kardashian? And I said, hey. Today I've got a guest that I am so interested to dive into his background because he's one of these guys who's made a lot of money but is ultra mysterious. And you're just like, man, how the heck do you even have money and know all these people and different things. This is the guy who's putting all these different events together behind the scenes. He spent tens of millions on just different influencer marketing. He's um, started big charities, the world's largest toy drive. He was the youngest founder ever for a publicly traded company. This dude's just done a ton of stuff and he's become a friend and somebody that I look to when I have questions or if I want to really build a relationship with someone. I've got none other than Dan Fleischman. What's up, man? Woo woo. Happy to be here. Yeah, dude. Fresh off the plane. Let's go. I know, <laughs> man. It's uh, it's funny because like anyone in like the entrepreneur space knows who you are. And then I, I would say probably for a long time, you're just kind of like this behind the scenes guy yeah. of like, dude, like, yeah, everyone knows Dan, but like nobody knows Dan, right. you know? And then um, recently you started your podcast, Money Mondays. And so now you're like out there way more than you used to be. How's yeah. that been? Um, I actually didn't even put my face on the image for the podcast because I didn't want to get famous, if you will. <laughs> um, I want to be known within the industry, but I want to be able to walk the street. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of like, yeah, business, business famous is what I want because then it's useful and it's functional. But I want to be able to like... You don't want to be Mr. Beast. Yeah. I don't want to even just like an Ed Milet or Andy Frisella, like even friends of ours, like they literally can't go to dinner without getting bombarded. Yeah. And so I, I'm okay with that at business events, but I don't want that to happen at like... Real life. Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, you, I don't think you're eating at Outback, dude. You you know, we're talking about if you're here in Vegas, you're eating at Berries or Ooh, fancy. any of the, the good ones. But yeah, dude, I mean, look, I'm I'm super interested because... One of the reasons we first started talking was because you actually just got, um, you did a merger with yep. my friends, Andrew and Eddie on Aspire. Yep. And you guys are going to hold how many events next year? 42. 42 <laughs> events. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, you just, yeah. we were just in Salt Lake for yep. the Limitless event. You had 7,000 people. Yep. Now you're speaking here at WealthCon at my event. Yep. Like you're just at events all the time. Yes. Like your life is events. Yes. How many events have you like thrown in your life? Oh my God, hundreds. Hundreds. Because there's charity events, business events, and then free events. Elevator Nights is free. Yeah. I've thrown that 52 times for free. Okay. So yeah, hundreds. I'm starting to see why events are so important. And, and we'll dive into that later. I don't want to bore people with that. Um, I want to actually know how you got to this point. Because most people know you in the industry with where you're at today. But very few like know your past, including me. Um, the fast forward version is 17 years old. I don't even want to know the fast forward <laughs> okay. version. I want to know like how it happened because <laughs> like, you're the founder of, a uh, uh, the youngest founder. I'm like, how the heck did that even happen? So high school is, you know, being like a little Gary Vee selling baseball cards and candy and things at school. Where was this at? What, where'd you San, grow up? San Diego. Okay. Uh, 17 years old. I trademarked the catchphrase. Who's your daddy? Really? So the slogan, I own it for everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's random. Um, do you, do you, do you make money from that? Not anymore. Um, when I, I, that's what I took public. It was under that brand name. Oh yeah. So I had energy drinks and clothing 19 years old. I did 9.5 million in sales with the clothing, <laughs> uh, 21. I started the process of going public, which took about two years, $2 million in accounting fees and legal fees and two years of, to go public 23. I go public and then my life changed. This is, this is April, 2005. This is a long time ago. Hold on before we even get to like 20, 2005 and you went public, I, I got to know, like, what was the thought process of, I mean, you're killing it at 19 years old to sell $10 million of swag, you yeah. know? And you're like, dude, I want to go public at night. Like who I thinks that, that? Meant, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Like Invest, what, what possessed bankers, you to do that? Investment bankers came to us and said, Hey, we can get you a bunch of funding. If you're publicly traded, um, you'll have more access to capital. You'll have more access to do deals. You can do and. You can like buy other companies, yeah, buy warehouses, inventory. everything using your stock as currency. No idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's like, there's not even smartphones back then, right? This is 2003, 2004. And so 
I just knew like, hey, if I had way more capital, I could do way more things. And I was launching an energy drink under the same name. The first one to be zero sugar, zero carbs, zero calories. And, <laughs> and who's your daddy energy drink? Right, exactly. <laughs> and actually Vegas was one of our biggest markets. I, I had billboards it. everywhere in the, in the valet of all the casinos. I had my energy shots in like every, every freaking hotel room. I had my energy shots in the little mini coolers, which was huge sales, crazy sales. And anyway, so um, go public. And with that capital, I, I launched us into 55,000 retail stores. So mm. for the next four years, I just don't sleep. I just drive and fly around the country. Again, smartphone doesn't exist yet. I'm just like calling and texting doesn't really a thing yet. And I'm going and visiting 43 distributors, mostly Budweiser, Coors, Miller, Pepsi, here in Vegas with Southern Wine Spirits, and going to all the retail stores myself. Yeah. Car washes, liquor stores, convenience stores, et cetera. Getting to 55,000 stores. I did that for 10 years. You were so. just selling them to, to yes. you know, have your, your product. Yes. Energy drinks, the, the cranberry pineapple and the green tea. And I, so we had the first green tea energy drink. And so we become number seven in the market. Obviously there's Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar, all the main players. And then I do that for a decade from 17 to 27. On the 10 year anniversary date of when I started the company, which was 518, I, I had hats that said 518. When I started the company, May 18th is when I resigned and I wanted to put another feather in my cap. Why? I had just done the same thing for a decade and I I was in 55,000 stores, which was a ton at the time. Now there's like 400,000 stores you could be in if you're a beverage like that. Um, but at then I kind of hit like, not capacity, but kind of where my cap was. And I wanted to start a poker site and mm -hmm. I, I wanted to move to Las Vegas and I wanted to like start an oh, online poker. Yeah. See, th see, there's so many, there's so <laughs> many twists and turns to the yeah. story. So like up to this point though, I mean, for 10 years running a publicly traded company, like how, I guess, lucrative was it for you personally? So only half the time were we public. The first five years I was a yeah. kid. And um, it was big. You know, we were ranging, our market cap was between 70 and 140 million on average. And I owned the majority of the stock. Yeah. And so it was good. And yeah. then along the way, we made money along the way also from the actual business itself. When, um, when you're doing that, like, you know, because there's all these things about like selling your stock and people don't like that. So like... Yep as a founder of a publicly traded company, I mean, yeah, you are making profits from the actual business and you yep. make a salary and all that, but like, how do you balance that situation of selling your stock to sure. try and like actually so make money? As a public executive, you have to report in the quarterly, quarterly earnings, quarterly reports, and in the monthly, there's a 10 Qs and eight Ks that you have to file. You have to report any stock that you sell, any compensation you get, even the expenses that you get reimbursed on, like, Hey, I paid for my Southwest flight. You got to report that. Mm -hmm. Hey, I bought toilet paper for the office. You got to report that. Like, yeah. Uh, and so the way you do it to not affect your stock share price or get people nervous is you do a stock sale plan. And so for the year or for two years or for three years or four years, you just set a set amount that you sell every single month automatically. Got it. Stock is up. You sell stock is down. You sell. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And if you do that, they don't, then they don't care because you're not doing it based on news or information or things that are going on in the business. If you all of a sudden sell 15% of your stock, that's going to be in the news. Yeah, they are like, wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on, right? And so to avoid that, we just had set stock price sales uh, okay. that didn't matter. Sorry, set stock sales that didn't matter based on the price. Got it. Okay. So you're kind of taking chips off the table yep. every month as time went on and making money in the company and everything. Yep. And then you resigned. Then I resigned on 10th anniversary date. You still own the stock. I still own stock at the time, but it goes from 55,000 stores to 18,000 to 4,500 all in two years. Because of the recession or what because happened? Because I left. Oh. I'm, I was literally driving around the country. Like when I say, I was literally driving and flying around the country. Right. And so if I'm not there with the distributors, they were less interested. If I'm not there with the retailers, they were less interested. And there wasn't someone to fill the void. We had a national sales manager on the phone, but not in person. Mm. If you don't go in person. Good luck. Out of sight, out of mind. They have hundreds of drinks that they could sell. Yeah. You know, and the other drinks are going to show up. Why? How do you get them? Because that shelf space is is limited. It's scarce. Oof, how do you yeah. get it? Oh, you pay for it. Okay. Yeah, that's the secret part that isn't necessarily secret, but like giving them perks and because I I remember my dad owned a convenience store, so I was actually pretty familiar mm -hmm. with this. And so he he was an entrepreneur. He owned a convenience store before he lost it all during the recession. But I remember like these Bud Light reps and mm -hmm. these guys would come in and they'd be like, hey, you want tickets to this game or this right. show or that? Which is actually technically illegal for alcohol companies to do that. Okay. 
Maybe it was, well, that, I mean, this was like 30 years ago. I don't know. Sure. I mean, I'm yeah. saying they didn't do it. I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they still did it. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, alcohol companies are not allowed to give away anything worth more than $5 to uh, store owners, okay. store managers. So, But Coca-Cola, all those guys can do whatever they want. Yes. Got yeah. it. It's because alcohol laws. Um, but even then, there was some restrictions and some like, you shouldn't say that or didn't do that. You can't like show up with a bag of cash. Like there was things like that. But it's literally called a slotting fee. And so you pay a slotting fee to have shelf space because eye level is buy level. So if you're up here on the shelves, that's the best. Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar, Coca Cola, Pepsi, Gatorade, these household name brands are literally the top shelves for a reason. They pay slotting fees and they have seniority yeah. and they have good sell through rates. If I took a household name brand like Red Bull and put it on the bottom shelf and wrapped a $20 bill around it, you wouldn't pay four bucks for that can, even though there's a $20 bill on it. Because you can't see it. Yeah. And so people literally pay for top shelves because it's useful. The human eye just doesn't go to the bottom shelves. D does Red Bull and those guys still have to pay for that? For sure. Okay. So and, they want to remain relevant. You got to pay. And I had a website back then called energydrinkwars.com. And because <laughs> Red Bull, Monster, and Rockstar hated me. And they hated each other. Yeah. And so when I say me, I don't mean Dan. They meant the brand. Who's because your daddy? Because I was getting real shelf space. I was getting like the third shelf for the side. I wasn't getting the top shelf, but I was getting second, third shelf, which was important. And I had a very colorful can, bright yellow, bright red. Red Bull, Monster, and Rockstar would physically pay to remove us or to throw us out. Like wow. literally throw us out. And so, for example, um, we were getting to nightclubs and bars. That's called on-premise. On-premise is huge marketing in your city because people, you know, everyone goes to the bar, goes to the restaurant, goes to the nightclub. They then go buy your drinks at a liquor store, grocery store, et cetera. Red Bull would pay for DJ boots. They would pay for remodels, pay for signage, pay for whatever the nightclub would want to be exclusive to remove us. One time we were in Costco. I get into Costco. It's a multi-million dollar order. Things are fantastic. But they kicked out Rockstar for us. So oh, Rockstar ain't happy about that. Rockstar's got a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <So, laughs> They'll make so, you pay for that yeah. one. Yeah. So six months later, Rockstar came in and negotiated a deal to not just uh, kick us out, they paid for all of our drinks. So that way we actually ended up getting money, making money from it. But I saw the letter that they wrote. They asked them to throw our drinks out in the garbage cans outside. And so people saw our drinks outside of Costco's all over the West Coast because Rockstar literally requested they dump our drinks out there so the customers could visually see it. That's how the, that's ruthless. Yeah. So we'd put up signs on like, you know, the light poles. We'd put like a six foot signs, like our, it's called the corrugated can. We put them up on light poles. They would come and cut them off and put theirs up. It was war. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's funny. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, if you want to grow your business, there is no better investment than your own personal brand. The smartest thing I ever did was start creating content and investing into my brand. Ever since then, we've been able to triple our business. I've been able to raise more money than ever to continue buying more real estate. And it's all because I create content just like this. Now, a lot of people have asked me, Ryan, how am I supposed to do it? I don't know where to start. I don't know who's going to edit it. I don't know even what kind of setup or camera or anything to do. Well, here's the thing. We can help you with all of that at Pineda Media. We have a podcast checklist that you can actually get for free at PinedaMedia.com that's going to go over everything you need on starting a podcast. But to make matters even better, we'll actually edit your podcast for you. We'll repurpose it into short form clips like you see on my Instagram and my TikTok so that people will start seeing those clips and watching your podcast and in turn being customers or investors in your business. So if you want the one-stop solution where you can get everything done for you, plus get the education you need to grow your personal brand, then you need to go to PinedaMedia.com and book a free call with our team. You can also go get that free podcast checklist and that training program absolutely free by just going there. So go check it out. So, you know, your, your, I guess, successor didn't put in the work that you were putting in to yeah. make it successful. He wasn't playing the game, like how it has to be played. For sure. How much, how much do they have to pay to like get there? Top so, shelf. So it depends. You What you really want is called an end cap display. End cap display is at the end of the aisle when you're walking down the I've grocery store. Yep. Yeah. And that looks like a full presentation. It looks like, you know, amazing. You'll see Logan Paul with Prime. He's got a lot of end cap displays. Very expensive, very worth it. Because the consumers, even if they don't necessarily buy you that day, they now know you really well. Yeah. Because you're right at the end of the walkway. 
Um, those are very expensive. You could be paying three thousand to five thousand dollars per store. Mind you, do the math. Is that like in a month or what? Yeah, a month or a quarter, depending on what your sell through rate is or what they expect you to sell through in that store. And so your profit might only be three thousand, five thousand for that section. Because you're, let's say you're doing ten to twenty grand in sales in that section for the month, that means your net profit's three to five grand. You're basically paying all of it, which is fine because the marketing that happens from you being on end cap at Ralph's or Vons or Smiths or Costco, et cetera, completely worth it. Yeah. Some people do it as a loss leader. Yep. I would pay for Walmart. I would literally pay to be on end cap at Walmart just because now you are legendary. Right now, every other chain store will buy you because you have an end cap display at Walmart. Oh. I could literally just walk in. By the way, that's what I did. I would just walk into retail meetings with big household name chains, Target, Vons, Ralph, 7 Eleven, et cetera. And I would basically say, hey, I'm already in Costco, Vons, CVS, Walgreens, my distributor's Budweiser. How many cases do you want? I didn't ask if they were going to buy or not. I literally was filling out order forms before I walked in yeah. with all their information on it and just basically figure out how much they wanted. I never asked if they wanted it. Well, you just had so much track record and credibility that you didn't have to. It's like, bro, everyone else is doing it. You're mm -hmm. not going to do this? Right. What's wrong with you? You're going to get in trouble if you don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And so that was my sales tactic that for four years, that's all I did. All 43 distributors that did the same thing. Why do you think you didn't like bring somebody else to help you? I had a national sales manager. I had sales reps that they were like the workhorses that would then follow up and deal with it. But no one was going to talk with as much passion as I was. Yeah. Like I still have passion for it because it just tasted good and people liked it and it was zero sugar, zero carb, zero calorie. The other cans are three bucks, we're two bucks. Like they're 8.4 ounce. We made a 16 ounce can. You guys are just better in every way. I just wanted to be better in every way um, and make the first good tasting energy drink because most of them taste like cough syrup. Yeah. Had that thick cough syrup taste to them because there's a main ingredient called taurine, which makes it have that. Yeah. Ugh. Anyways. And so I was passionate about it. And it's not that someone else couldn't sell it also. We had sales reps. I just knew that for the chain stores, the distributors, I had to go in person. Got it. Okay. So you end up kind of going through this phase. Yep. After 10 years, you're like, I'm good. I want to move on with my life. Yep. I want to Time to start a poker, poker site. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right before it gets banned. Exactly. So I pick up and move to Las Vegas and a place called Malta. Never heard of Malta in my life. It's right underneath the boot of Italy. I go out to Malta with a backpack on. And 10 weeks later, I have an online poker site. 10 months later, it's the top five poker site in the world. What was it called? It was called Victory Poker. Okay. But I had Dan Bilzerian, DJ Steve Aoki, Playboy Playmates, 21 Poker Pros, all the young cool guys. And we were on TV every single day, all over the planet. I was playing on TV, Antonio Sfandiari, I would have like Playboy Playmates on freaking Fox playing. Yeah. <laughs> like I was teaching them how to play. And so our content would get millions and millions of views. Bill Zarian is just getting into social media at the time and he's making huge noise and like blowing up RVs and renting private jets and yachts <laughs> with girls. You know, like yeah. this is the start 2009, 2010. And uh, it gets really big, like really big, really fast. And it's really fun. And you can still see the content if you look up Victory Poker on YouTube. It's still a lot of fun content. Who were the guys? Like, I mean, I know Full Tilt, Poker Stars. Yeah, there were two uh, What was the other one that got popped really bad? Absolute Poker. Absolute Poker, yeah. yeah. So Poker Stars, for context, was doing $8 million a day in revenue. That's crazy. Just in all their pot fees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's crazy. It's insane. And Full Tilt was doing almost $4 million a day. It was oh, insane. Poker Stars was bigger. I didn't know. Yeah. I thought Full Tilt was the Poker biggest. Poker Stars ended up buying Full Tilt. Got it. Poker Stars was more of a global brand. Got it. And so... We were not doing that. We were doing that in a month, not, not in a day, <laughs> uh, which was still great. You know, I only had five employees and running this whole thing. Yeah. But anyways, and so then April 15th is what's called Black Friday. <laughs> the whole online poker market in America gets shut down. Yep. Those guys that we just mentioned, the FBI sees their websites, sees their bank accounts in 16 countries. Yeah. It was a crazy day. I was playing online poker back then as a yeah. teenager. Well, I guess I would have been 18. Well, what year, what year was that? 2010. Yeah. So 11, I, was in, yeah. I was actually in college. But yeah. yeah, I remember playing poker in college to like kind of fun college. That's so fun. Yeah. That's so fun. I was a heads up guy. There was a lot of heads up battles on there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that changed everything. You know, online poker got shut down. I didn't get shut down, but I didn't want to like worry what was going to happen next. So I manually paid back 41,000 players the next four days. 
you could just, you withdrew their accounts for them. Yeah, we, po- we posted everywhere and emailed everybody like, hey, withdraw your accounts, but 41,000 of them didn't. And so we had to manually, imagine back then, a, de- a decade ago. <laughs> There's no manually. AI. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess even like during that time, how did you build these relationships with uh, Bulzarian and Aoki and all these famous people? Um, poker was one. I met a lot of people playing in the mid stakes, high stakes poker games. Just as like a passion. You were just playing poker yeah. anyway. Yeah. I was playing poker. As soon as I was 18, I started playing poker. And as soon as I was 21, I would come to Vegas on the weekends and play poker. Like I was obsessed playing poker. It was my one vice. I just loved it. And so I read every book, studied everyone. I wanted to get as good as possible to be interested in it and like good at it. And then I started playing in the house games. In the house game, there's celebrities and athletes and business guys. So I started meeting a lot of people from the high stakes poker scene. And then I started throwing events. I threw charity poker events. Mm. And at these charity poker events, I would also invite models, business people. And so like there was a lot of athletes there. And so the athletes want to meet the models. Models want to meet the business guys and the athletes. The Everyone wanted to meet each other. And I was creating that space for that while raising 50K to quarter million dollars for charity during these charity event, charity poker tournaments. Got it. And so I threw these pretty often. And uh, that was my initial ways to meet a lot of people. Mm. So back then, I mean, Bulzarian wasn't anybody until, you know, later on down the road, he just starts making content and everything. Like with him, what what was he like in the early stages? Did he just have this mapped out? He was like, I'm just going to be this guy who's taking social media seriously. Like what happened? So what's fascinating is he's identical then as he is now. And he's identical to the content that he is now. Everything was real. The people feel like it's staged. The moment is staged for them to pause to take the photo or the image or the video, but it's not staged in the sense of like, we were having dinners at Panorama Towers with 40 girls on a Friday and three or four dudes. Like those <laughs> are, that was real. And that didn't happen once in a while. That happened often. That was his real life before social media. And then when social media happened, it started to escalate. Yeah. But like him traveling around with girls and partying and like yachts and jets, that was, he was just with or without a cell phone, he's doing it. And even now you notice he barely posts anymore. It's still happening. Yeah. Like I still get the text message. I still see the pictures. Like it's still li- real life to him. Um, and so people gravitated to that. The big turning point was when he started posting it, obviously he grew quite quickly and other people would repost it because they liked the lifestyle. Yeah. And so kind of like the Andrew Tate model, so many people were posting about him that made him more famous. And then the turning point was he did like a Xbox giveaway and he just said, uh, tag your friends. And like 150,000 people tagged three friends each, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then he did a charity thing that um, he doesn't really talk about charity much, but he does a lot of charity stuff. He did a charity thing like, hey, I'm going to give away $10,000 to 10 families. Tag, comment below and tag three friends. Comment the story. He had to hire like a dozen people to go through the stories. Ended up giving way more than 100K. He gave out way more. He just doesn't talk about it. And But that had hundreds of thousands of comments. That mm. tag, that You know, so like, those moments in time back when the tag a friend thing worked really well, people still try to do it, but it worked really well back then, uh, culminated in him getting millions of followers really fast. Got it. And everybody at back then was just kind of winging it. Nobody sure. knew what worked and what didn't work. So, but you, it's funny you met him in poker because everybody, uh, like, I guess the story was he made all his money in poker initially. And then people are like, he's not even good at poker. Like, so is he actually a good poker player? So, he does really well in house games okay. against poker pros. It's hard. Yeah. Nobody's good against poker pros. And so he'll have swings winning and losing versus poker pros. But in house games, there's very few people in the world history that have won more than him. He mm. beat one guy for $53 million. <laughs> I introduced him. I know for sure. So people are like, Oh, it's fake. No, no, I know for sure. <laughs> like I was there in some of the rooms and, and I, the payout actually yeah, happened. Yeah. He posted one of them, the $10.8 million wire. He posted his screenshot from his bank account. Got it. My friend who he took it from, he was not happy about it, but like, it These happened. are real life things that a lot of people have their own versions of the stories. No, no, it's a hundred trillion percent real because I literally was there and I know I'm friends with those guys. I still have to hear about it to this day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bad beat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Bilzerian does have losses along the way, but he's had some of the biggest wins in poker history. Yeah. Who do you think's the best poker pro you've seen? It's not close. It's Phil Ivey. Yeah. There's, you know, in every sport there's like, oh, is it Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson or is it Jordan or LeBron or Kobe? No, no. In poker, it's just one guy. It's Phil Ivey. Yeah. It's not close. Yeah. In anything. Internet, tournament, poker, online, heads up. Doesn't matter. Any, he'll any just, game. He'll stomp you in any game. Any game variation. Can you beat him in the course of an hour? Sure. Can you beat him over the course of 24 hours? It's not possible. 
Wow. I want to get him on the podcast. You should. He lives here. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think he he's so good? Like, how did he become so great at it? It was his obsession since he was a kid when he was called No Home Jerome. You know, he would stay under a bridge and go play 18 years old, 19 years old, go play in Atlantic City. Like, he just was the best. He studied everything you could. And he has that it factor of no fear. He don't care. It doesn't He'll matter. go to zero. He don't care. It doesn't even matter. He knows he's going to build it back up. He's willing to risk it all. He can see through your soul. When he's playing. <laughs> like, it's unreal. That's funny. So uh, your, your poker site goes down with everyone else's. Yep. And now you're like, what do we do? If you are trying to grow your real estate investing business, then you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. You have no idea what Wealthy Investor is. It is our coaching program and community. We have helped thousands of students worldwide grow their business. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're trying to get that first deal. We can help you do that. If you're trying to scale your business and go from a few deals a year to a few deals a month or even seven figures a year, we can help you do that too. In fact, last year alone, we had over 30 students do over a million dollars in revenue. And I'd love for you to be the next one. So it's pretty simple. If you're trying to grow your business and wholesale more homes or flip more homes or buy more rental properties, then you need to go to wealthyinvestor.com and book a free call with our team. It's super simple. We'll go on a strategy call with you and figure out how we can help you grow according to your needs. So all you got to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com, book the free call with the team, and we'll see you there. I had an epiphany the next week. I'm like, do I sit on the floor and cry about it and just be like, oh no, I lost a $65 million company overnight? Or do I get back in the swing of things? And so immediately I started consulting for some really big companies, for land-based casinos and for a huge in, in financial institution that was researching um, the poker world of what would happen in gaming in the future. And so I got a bunch of consulting gigs and I started angel investing. So I'm like, hey, I went all in on my one company for 10 years. Then I went all in on this company. I've only done two companies my whole life. I don't want to be all in on any one thing ever again. That's why if you notice my life now, I've got so many moving parts. Yeah. Um, I don't want to have the risk or fear of waking up one morning, which is what happened in poker. Bilzerian called me at 10, 10 a.m. I'll never forget it. Like, where are you? And he told me about Black Friday. I don't want to ever wake up to that phone call. And if I do for a certain niche company or industry, it's not going to cripple me the way that did. Yeah. So what happened? So started consulting, started angel investing, and I started my elevator nights. Mm -hmm. I started elevator studio. Um, so I started my social media agency. I started throwing these free events, elevator nights, which is how I met a lot of people during those. Um, and then the social media agency just took off because there was no social media agency. Yeah. Nobody knew what an influencer was. I didn't know what an influencer was. I just knew celebrities or people had followings and if they posted a product, it would sell. Yeah. And so I started getting campaigns for Postmates and DraftKings and Lyft and Uber. and So they would come to you and they'd be like, we want so-and-so to post about us and you broker deals. They would come to us and say, here's money. Who's so-and-so? Got it. So we picked 99% of the time. I pick for them. Oh. Right. And so I would then have DJ Khaled or Kim Kardashian or Kylie Jenner or Tyga or whoever posts about Fit T, Fashion Nova, Pretty Little Thing. So consumer products or general brands like Lyft, Postmates, et cetera. How, like, how did you even build relationships with Kim Kardashian? I just paid her. <laughs> so, but like, how'd you get in touch with her to even pay her? Uh, her, we have a, a mutual friends. Okay. And I told mutual friend, I said, hey, uh, I like to give her six figures to do a couple posts about this Fit T. And then I also want to pay her six figures to post about Fashion Nova. If you can get me in, I'll give you a percentage of what I pay her. Yeah. And he was like, of course. <laughs> 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 um, and he's dear friends with them, like been family friends with them forever. And um, he's super close with Scott Disick and that whole squad. And so he drove me over there to Chris Jenner's house and we sat in the living room and I brought actual cash with me and like <laughs> ready cash to Cash money. And I just to showcase, it wasn't enough to pay for the whole thing, but I was like, I just want to show you how serious I am. Here's a deposit for the first few posts. I would like to have all the daughters and sisters, you know, posting. And so I'm happy to spend six figures each with each girl. And so and then I met with them again. And obviously it's checks and wires after that. Uh, <laughs> and it's been that relationship. Like I don't hang out with them. I just pay them. And I try to get them to charity events and things like that. But I, 
they know if I call them, I'm going to pay them the same day. If I say, hey, will you post for this Sugar Bear Hair or Fit Tea or Fashion Nova and all these brands that I brought them, I was going to get them paid right away within 24 yeah. hours. Well, I think back then too, these influencers didn't really have their own businesses and companies. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine most of their revenue was from that. And then eventually... Kim and Kylie realized like, we might as well just start our own thing, dude. Right. They're, they're, if they're making, if they're paying us this much, how much could we be making doing right. our own thing? And they'll still do endorsement deals. If you look at Kylie, she's doing a deal with Glow Water. Like Glow Water is a guy named Kev who owns a big toy company. And it's a multi-million dollar deal and she has equity, et cetera. But like Glow Water, she has to, she's posting it every single month. Got it. So, but she's got equity also, not just cash. Exactly. Right. Multi-million dollars in cash, but also equity. And so, if someone wants to go pay a Kim Kardashian now, it's much different now when she's got skims, she's a bazillionaire. Um, the rate's very, very high and they have to protect their brand. Yeah. So they'd be very picky about who they work with. Um, but for the most part, most celebrities influencers don't have a product. And so for them, they're not going to turn down 10 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand, et cetera. Why would they? To just post about a product, brand or service. Yeah. So... With that being said, you you kind of start pioneering this this space of paying celebrities for advertising. At that point, all these advertisers were just paying the traditional ways of commercials and billboards right. and magazines and whatever. Um, how long were you doing that for? This is over a decade ago. I mean, this is like when people were, I was paying for tweets. Yeah. Their Instagram wasn't even a thing. Yeah. Instagram was just getting started. And so I was paying for Facebook posts. And as platforms started coming up, I would pay for Snapchat posts. As new platforms would arise or get traction, I would pay them for either cross-platform posts or platform-specific posts for that celebrity influencer. But keep in mind, I was also paying a lot of fitness influencers, a lot of personal trainers, a lot of chefs, a lot of moms, moms with 100,000 followers. I was paying a lot of them. Like I was paying a lot of, a lot of Instagram girls, like models. Yeah. I pay 3,500 Instagram girls alone. I have W9, 3,500 Instagram girls. That's crazy. It's like chasing cats to get them to fill out W9s because, <laughs> it's, um, but it's it's worth it for them. You know, getting 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, two grand, five grand, 10 grand, whatever it is, based on their following to post about a product. It makes perfect sense for them to post about a dress, a bikini, a tea product, a hair product, et cetera. Um, everyone wins in the situation. Yeah. So with these influencers and everything, how has the landscape evolved the last decade? So back then there was thousands of influencers. Now there are millions of influencers and there's technically tens of millions of influencers, if not more, if you count micros. And so that makes it different because everyone feels like they're an influencer and theoretically they all are. You could have 10,000 followers and be an influencer because if people will make a purchasing decision or take an action because of you, you're an influencer. So a mom with 4,000 followers is technically an influencer. Yeah. So that changes things a lot because brands know that they could pay 300 moms, 300 models, 300 personal trainers for the same price as like one celebrity yeah. post, mm -hmm. right? Spend the same hundred grand and get literally a thousand people posting about your brand, brand product or service. That is powerful. And you're not gambling on one celebrity influencer that's going to do diversified. a post. Yes. And those thousand influencers that you pay of different sizes, they're going to care because you're paying them 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, whatever. So the landscape has changed a lot in that regard that five years ago, there wasn't a ton of moms and fitness influencers and things like that. They were there, but it wasn't at the scale that it is now. Yeah. So it seems like the bigger influencers get hurt by this. Yes. So they have uh, they have priced, them, uh, priced themselves out where a brand product or service, it's just too expensive. It's too much of a risk. Yeah. And so do they still do it? Of course they do because they want to have the attachment to the celebrity or large influencer. But from a financial perspective, it's safer to get hundreds of influencers or thousands of influencers to post something. Yeah. What did you think about TikTok when you, it first came out? So there's really rare for a new social media platform to come up yeah. because hundreds and hundreds have tried, hundreds of hundreds have faded away, right? None of them have ever scratched the surface. This one was interesting because they bought Musical.ly, which was doing well as a short form dance content app, kind of like Vine. And so Vine was the one of the few that could have gone on to become big, except with the, you know, the meltdown that they had. Uh, but if you really think about it, there's only been the main seven platforms the last decade. 
lots of other brands try to pop up. None of them have a chance. When they bought Musical.ly, this is a multi-bazillion dollar company out of Asia. When they bought Musical.ly and converted it over to TikTok, it's called, the parent company is called ByteDance. They have a huge amount of capital, a huge amount of infrastructure, and they already have a solid base of people that are on the platform. And so what was smart was TikTok was originally making people, uh, helping people go, fam go viral, go famous. So you might get 400 views, 3,000 views, 200 views, and then boom, 4 million. Yep. That doesn't happen much anymore. So it's, I'm, I'm surprised that they don't do that anymore. It's actually hurting them a lot. Yeah. They, that's what made them stand out is that a random kid, a random girl, a random mom, a senior citizen could just go viral, get millions of views, and all of a sudden, yeah, they become addicted to the platform. Now, it happens much, 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 much uh, more rarely. Why do you think that is? Money. Just more users? Money. They, these platforms, are they care so much about the revenue and the algorithm so much that they want people to spend money on ads or spend money for reach. And so... All of them have restricted their content. All of them have throttled their reach. And it's really sad to see. It's very short-sighted. They would make way more money if people were still addicted the way they used to be. When I say they, the influencers are not as addicted to posting. Because the, the return's not as good. They're not getting as the views they used to get. Correct. That's yeah. Why, why do you think Bilzerian and Kylie and all these people, they post much less often now? It's not as fun when they used to get a million likes on something. Now they get a couple hundred thousand. It's not like a little decrease. You're talking about a 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% de decrease. Nothing changed about their content. It's still good, fun content or interesting content, but they're not rewarding it the same because they they want people to pay for it. They want yeah. people to pay for reach. Well, I'll tell you, when I started taking social media seriously during the pandemic, I also was discouraged um, from trying to like even create content because back then, Instagram before Reels was always pay to play. Like there was like no way to get reach. And anyone who had a following usually had like shout outs and all this other crap. And then I remember TikTok came along and like people were getting massive reach with zero following. I was like, all right, this seems like a fair game to play. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just start posting and po I'm like, dude, I just got 100,000 followers in 90 days right. making content. I'm like, this is crazy. And so I was like all in on making TikToks. And then eventually, obviously, Instagram copied and then they did the same thing for a long time of like, oh, you can make reels and get known. And so, you know, my Instagram grew because of their openness now to doing that. And then YouTube is the same way, you know, just a much harder game. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just interesting because you're definitely more incentivized to try and create content if you know that you're not fighting like this massive battle. It's very short sighted. Um, I don't know that it's going to change. And I actually think it's going to get worse. Okay. They're making too much money and they don't really care about the end user in that sense or the influencer in that sense, not realizing that the influencer is what built them. The yeah. Re the reason people are staying on these platforms is to engage with influencers, people they look up to, they're heroes, people that cook, people that teach, people that do yoga. Like they're there for content, not just for their friends on social. Yeah. That's an interesting thing now that you're saying that because. When social first started, it was about your friends. Mm -hmm. So like Facebook and MySpace and everything. Now, when I think about social, it's like, yeah, your feed is going to be like these people you don't even know because they make great content. It's mm -hmm. like what you like versus like, you're not going to get a lot of your friend's stuff because you're going to see their stuff. I don't see my friend's stuff. Do you? No. Not really. Yeah. Well, my friends are famous now, so I do. Yeah. But and, like my normal right. friends, I don't see. You don't see like your friend from high school. No. I literally don't see it at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting shift in dynamic. I wonder if somebody comes up with like the friend, you know, <laughs> platform. Friendster. Look, we're going back to <laughs> your your actual friends, not your. If people someone you made to. a platform and it just was um, the original algorithm, which is essentially in chronological order, people would be obsessed. The hard part is. Zuckerberg will buy or crush any new platforms. <laughs> that's true. He will. Remember Snapchat? Me neither. Yeah. As soon as Snapchat, as soon as he couldn't buy Snapchat, he made Instagram stories. Yeah. Bye bye Snapchat. Yeah. It just became a texting platform. Do you think threads will actually figure it out? So it's really tough. So obviously it's the fastest growing platform in history. And Zuckerberg made it easy because you just click and you can have a, a thread account from your Instagram or Facebook. But because they rushed it to compete with Twitter, it 
is a platform that fell flat on its, fa- on its face. Yeah. There wasn't enough to do there. You can't DM anyone. You can't share the way you want to. You can't repost the way you want to. Like, you can't do the things that you want to that are on Instagram, which would basically just be a knockoff of Instagram. But all you can do is kind of scroll through. And the people that created content are just copy and pasting quotes. Yeah. And so it became not engaging of a platform and nothing to do. And so everyone rushed over there and it was fun. It was cool. And people were growing following like crazy. And so it had all the things that made people want to use it. And now it's a ghost town because it's just copy and paste. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if uh, it will figure itself out like, or how long he'll give it before kind of killing it. Yeah. It's a, there's not much risk to him because he has the user base that's there. The engagement's very low. If you notice, the engagement is quite low on most posts that are there. Uh, but when he does add all the features and he adds DMs and he adds ads and he adds other things for people to do, or maybe he'll add voice, maybe he'll do like a clubhouse thing on there. Like when he adds other things to threads, uh, people will use them. They already have an account. I, I just, right now it's very lackluster because there's not much to do. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, you, you built your career first in the, you know, beverage industry, and then you go into the social media industry for 10 years. And I, I guess through both of those, you know, you learned the value of like in-person mm-hmm. meeting, you know, whether it was these distributors, whether it was your your charity poker nights to, you know, cutting these big influencer deals and holding these events that, you know, build more relationships. And now to me, it just seems like your career is going to just be, you know, purely events and investing. So that's the turning point now is that I still run the agency. I still do the charity events, but the live events business with this whole Aspire Tour deal and our four masterminds, it is like a huge priority now because it feeds into everything I'm doing, right? I go to these live events and that we're hosting, owning, or speaking at other people's events like WealthCon. Like I'll go speak at other people's events in person. It's, I don't want to say like a rock concert, but it's kind of like a rock concert. You remember when you went to Metallica as a kid, you remember when you went to see household name rapper or celebrity or country star, whatever, you remember those moments. That similar feeling happens at entrepreneur events and business conferences and charity events. You remember seeing Ryan Pineda. You remember seeing Ed Milet. You remember those moments of going to those things. And so I've become obsessed with being at all these events and seeing my friends and seeing entrepreneurs and seeing fans, followers, et cetera, because they remembered those moments. And You've had it happen to you plenty of times. I'm sure that they're like, oh, I remember when I met you in 2018. Do you remember? Well, yeah. Of course you don't remember because yeah. you met thousands of people, but they do. Yeah. And it's important to them and they remember that moment. And so I've made a part of my personal mission to be at as many events as I can for those moments. And I'm rallying my business friends and entrepreneurs and et cetera to be at all these events because we're creating moments. We're creating experiences. We're creating networking that then leads to stuff. Elevator Nights is free. I'll keep it free forever. But in those moments, I have 300 to 1,000 guests for free. They're networking. They're meeting. They're learning. And stuff happens. And then they come back next time like, ah, oh, at your Elevator Nights, I met my my now wife, my now business partner, my now blah, blah, blah. I've had people show up with a kid. They're like, look, we met, <laughs> we met at Elevator Nights three years ago. And now they have a kid. Yeah, uh, Those are real life stories that like, yeah. and so I'm obsessed with throwing events. And that's why I like that you throw wealth con so often is like, you're making people be in a room and talk about investing, business, strategy, networking, et cetera. And the butterfly effect is bigger than we'll ever know. Yeah. Because they go off and do things. Yeah. One of my uh, wealthy investor students, he came to WealthCon, I think, three events ago. So we do it every quarter. And young kid. And he was like, yeah, you know, he joined the program then. Next quarter, he meets this girl at the event. Last event, he tells me, he's like, hey, we got something to tell you. He's like, we're engaged. Whoa. And I was like, oh, nice. And they're like, we got something to ask you. Um, will you marry us? Come on. And I was like, what? I was like, you're going to officiate the wedding? I was like, I guess I'm going to have to go get like ordained and everything. So cool. Yeah. So <laughs> that's going to be great content. <laughs> yeah. That, so that was, uh, that was funny. Um, <laughs> and maybe it was like, maybe there was one extra event in between. I can't remember the full detail, but it was within a year, yeah. you know? And then um, we had another couple. This was last event. They joined the program. And they're young. They're like 20, each of them. And they're like, yeah, you know, we had come to Vegas just to actually get married. And we saw your ads for WealthCon. So we decided to go to the event first. And they're like, yeah. And so then we ended up joining the program and everything. But 
you know, we're getting married tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, that's so crazy. You like came to get married. Wow. You end up coming to this event that now you're going to go start your real estate career and all this stuff. It's wild. So yeah, I agree with you. I, I love throwing events and you know, it's interesting, right? You would know this. Um, events are, they can be profitable, but they're very hard to, to make sure. profitable because it costs a lot of money. I mean, you guys, your guys' events cost even more than our events. And it's like, we're, we're spending at least half a million bucks mm -hmm. every wealth con and, you know, to cover ticket sales, to cover just all the other things and to, you know, turn a profit. They're not like super, super lucrative at the end of the day compared to other things you might be able to do. Right. But I personally enjoy the long-term benefits of it. Yep. You know, the relationships, the brand that you build, the um, business opportunities, the the partners you meet, like all these things you're saying, they're all like the ancillary benefits that actually outweigh the events p &L itself. Right. So if I broke even on events, I would still do them. If I lost a bit, I would still do them. Yeah. The I don't want to say the profitability is irrelevant because it's not irrelevant, but it's not that relevant compared to if I get people joining the masterminds, if I get people investing in the deals, if I get people donating to charity, if I get people posting about me or my businesses or my brands, all of those things, I can't even extrapolate and figure out what is all that worth. Yeah. I, I don't know. But I know that it happens every single time. And if I keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, it, it just keeps happening. Yeah. And so for for me, like, I want to make them profitable, um, most of them, but it, keep in mind, the world's largest pizza festival, I throw for free. That cost me a million dollars to throw every time. The world's largest pizza festival. Yeah, I've done it twice for my birthday. Why do you throw that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I throw it for a thousand influencers. It's 850 girls, 150 guys. And I bring in, last time was Steve Aoki and Lil Wayne. So wait, yeah. you have 850 girls and what are, what are they doing? It's just a party, it's a one day party. So it's a one day pizza party. Yes. The last one cost me nine hundred seventy-two thousand dollars to be exact. <laughs> okay, so what? <laughs> just how do, you, million. how do you even potentially get profitable? <laughs> I can't. I don't charge anything. <laughs> okay, so you just charge a million <laughs> bucks. You lose a million birthday bucks. Party. Yes, it's just my birthday party. But branding-wise, a thousand people with their phones out are posting about my birthday party you know, yeah. at the pizza festival, and I did it twice. The other one I had Tyga, two chains, and Wiz Khalifa perform, and same thing, same venue, same thing. I'm, yeah. do, I'm doing it again next year, and so. That is branding. My charity events cost me a ton of money. Obviously, I don't monetize that. Yep. Elevator nights. I've thrown that 52 times. It cost me 20 to 50 grand every time. You can do the math. I'm 52 times 20 to 50 grand. I spent over a million dollars throwing elevator nights for free. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are loss leaders for me that are not going to convert to sales, but stuff happens. Yeah. Right? When people show up to my birthday parties, charity events, elevator nights, et cetera, they're talking about me. They're posting about me. They're introducing me. They're doing stuff. It only, happens. it only works if you have the back end right. to do stuff after. Yes. Like that's how I always looked at social media. I was like, dude, it doesn't make sense that I'm going to go spend 50 grand a month, like to mm -hmm. produce all this content. Right. Because like, I'm not going to make it from YouTube AdSense. I'm not going to no. make it from sponsorship deals. I don't even want them, you know, but you had the back end businesses and infrastructure and skill set. Then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Correct. If you can monetize something, whether you're selling courses you're selling, you sell solar, you sell accounting, you're a lawyer, you're a dentist, a doctor. If getting more famous will lead to sales, then you should spend a lot of money to get more famous. Well, I think too, it's like getting famous is just simply having attention. Yes. And when so, I say famous, I don't mean like. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and, but to your point, uh, I think when, I mean, for me, I was like, well, social media is the best way to get attention when I first started. I'm like, let's do that. But you realized 10 plus years ago that events were the mm -hmm. way to get attention, right? You, you're you the guy who hosts this big event. That's like what they did for way before social media. That was how you became like right, Tony somebody Robbins. known. Right. Yeah, Tony Robbins. He's been doing it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. How many events has that guy thrown? I can't even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. But I didn't even know this until Brad Lee told me. Um, he was sitting right where you were and he was just telling me about the early days with him and Cardone and how there was just them and like a few of these guys on this event circuit and they were just doing these seminars all over mm -hmm. the country, just about throwing. cars and real estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Car salesmen and real estate. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. I guess that was the only way to get known. Like there was no social media. 
Those expos used to be humongous. Really? 20,000 people, 10,000 people, 5,000 people, 20,000 people. It was insane. Like the Real Estate Wealth Expo, the LA Convention Center, 20,000 people. And it's like Marshall Silver and Magic Johnson and like, (laughs) you know, um, yeah. So where do you see it going today? I mean, like we're talking about how, yeah, events were the only play. And then social media came along and it was like, well, this thing's way more powerful than events. Like instead of being in front of even 20,000 people, I'll make a reel right now. And boom, 20,000 people just saw it in a minute. Right. So the events are where the social media content comes from. So that's the Gary Vee model, right? I can speak at an event or Ryan can speak at an event and then that can be cut up into dozens and dozens of pieces of content. And then again, if you extrapolate that out, you speak at a bunch of events and throw your own events, you now have unlimited content. Yeah. Uh, for yourself. And so my vision is hosting these events basically almost every week now. And during those events, making content, I make some of them cell phone content, some of them s- same night content of the event, some of them a highlight reel, and then 30 to 60 second clips of the best parts of speeches, whether it's me or someone else. And so by doing that, I create this omnipresence where like that one event might be three hours or one day or three days or whatever it is, but it lives on for months and months and months because I keep posting content about it. I posted a highlight reel a few hours ago from the Limitless event from last Saturday. Yeah. Right? I'm going to post another highlight video about that thing in a week or two. Mm -hmm. So that event that happened last Saturday is going to live on for months and months. I'm going to post clips of Goggins and Gary Vee and you and everybody. I'm going to post clips and then all of a sudden they're going to blink their eyes and boom, it's April 27th and we're doing it again. Yeah. Right? So I'm just going to keep planting seeds. It's just always happening. Yes, it's always happening. Yeah. I thought that would be a problem for WealthCon because most people, if they're even lucky, will throw one big event a year. Right. For sure. And for me, I was like, well, I never intended to throw like a big event every quarter. It was just like a small little mastermind every quarter. And then it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then now it is what it is. And I don't know where it's going to continue to go, but it, it's definitely not easy. But there is now like this omnipresence about it to what you said where, hey, a thousand people are now posting about my event yes. and getting me exposure, doing the Dan Bilzerian method, the Andrew Tate method of what you said. Like if you can get everyone else posting about you, right. you win. Mm-hmm especially even if they're micro influencers. Absolutely. It all adds up fast. Yeah. Even if they have a couple thousand followers, times up by a thousand people at WealthCon. Yeah. Times up by four WealthCons a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the math gets really crazy just off of that. Yeah. I guess what I'm thinking about is where does it, I guess, all lead? Because on one hand, guys like you and I are going to like be the event holders. Mm-hmm. And so let's just say the gatekeepers because not many people are doing it. And the cool thing I found, I know you found it too, is when you are like one of a premier events, people will come speak for free, right? They just want to be a part of it because it's good exposure for them. Yep. And I've met so many great people. I've had them on the podcast and everything else because of the event. And, you know, maybe after a podcast, I'm like, hey, dude, I want you to speak at a wealth con. And or or they already come in knowing that's what they want to do. Sure. And I'm like, yeah, dude, like let's let's roll. And so I'm just like thinking, man, okay, if I keep throwing these big events and stuff, how many great relationships I'm gonna make because of the stage? Mm-hmm. And the podcast is the same thing, it's a stage. It's like, yeah, to now I have to turn down so many people. I have to literally turn down so many people. Every wealth con and sure. podcast who are very high high quality people, right. just because there's only a limited supply. Yes, it's a it is a hard part of throwing events is you got to turn down f- literally friends or people you look up to, celebrities, business moguls, etc. From speaking because there's only X amount of hours. The podcast you can only do X amount per year. You're only going to do 52 to 156 podcasts a year, right? Mm-hmm. Either one a week up to three a week. So yep. when you think about that. That's how many guests you can have. Yeah. That's it. That's the cap. When you have an eight-hour event or a 24-hour event for three, you know, three, eight, three days of eight hours each, you only have X amount of speaking slots. That is tough. Also, as tough is if you throw a VIP dinner or you throw an after party or you throw a pre-party. Or right now I can hear people here for a VIP event. Yeah. And then you have friends or acquaintances. Hey, can that, I go? Can I go? Yeah. And then as you get more and more popular, more and more famous, throw more and more events, there's a lot more of the, hey, can I go? And so like we threw the night before our event, $10,000 ticket, we sold all 80 spots because we can only have 150 people, 150 people there, including staff. 
there's 28 speakers, plus they can bring a guest. That's 56. So if you do the math, I only could sell 80 spots, 80 spots times 10 grand each. If a friend wants to go for free, I'm literally have to, basically losing $10,000 by them going. Mm -hmm. That's a hard discussion. Because you can't over flood it. That's a hard discussion. Yeah. Because people paid 10 grand to be in the room with, you know, household name speakers and um, celebrities, et cetera. And so those are awkward discussions. <laughs> yeah. And I had to like draw a line and these are with friends. Yeah. People I'm close with, people I would travel with, like people I'm really close with. I had to say, listen, like I don't want to charge you $10,000. I'm not asking for that, but it's also not fair to my, our other mutual friends that paid 10 grand. Right. And so then it's kind of on them to not be a jerk and be like, oh, well, you know, we're closer friends or higher friends <laughs> on the friend chart, you know? And so that's going to happen. Think about the next one. Yeah. We're doing it again, a VIP party the night before April 27th. It's 10 grand again. And how many more friends are going to want to go now that they saw Steve Aoki smashing cakes and Ed Milet and Andy yeah. Priscilla and David Goggins. Goggins doesn't go to parties. Yeah. For all his first party in his life. <laughs> like, and you, yeah. And you got him walking around this event. Like this was amazing. You know, like, and so what's going to happen the next one? Same thing. Hey, can I go? Yeah. It's a very, it's a hard part of this situation is that mathematically, I, we have a lot of friends and we're going to grow a lot more from throwing events. The demand and anyone is listening, you're, if you throw an event, that's going to happen. Yeah. It's a good problem. I know. I'm not complaining about it. Yeah. yeah. But it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's a problem for sure. And people can get offended and you know, it is what it is, yeah. but you know, funny story about that. So Aoki, you know, I don't know how many house parties the guy's done, mm -hmm. but you know, so he's, he's DJ in the house party and they're like Keaton and Andy Elliott and, I forgot who asked us, but they were like, yeah, do you guys want to get caked? Yeah. And I was like, whatever, I'll get caked, <laughs> whatever. And so as he's coming out with the cakes and stuff, I watch him throw the first one and just how he like, it. he nails it, bro. He's like shot puts it <laughs> like yeah. freaking firm. Yeah. And it's just An explosion, everywhere, yes. dude. It's not, it's not what I thought. <laughs> and I was like, dude, and I'm dressed nice. Yeah. I got my Louis Vuitton shoes on. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have that to, reason I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to pass on the cake. Like I'm going to, I don't even want to be in the vicinity yeah. because it cake goes flies. everywhere. Mm -hmm. It was, it was crazy just watching it, like how messy it got. Yes. And then on Saturday he got me. Oh, he got you. Yeah. At the end of the event, he just creeped up from behind me as I'm doing the closing remarks with, with the muscle. And I saw the muscle take two steps back. And I just knew it was on. And I, you can see the video. Oh, he got you on stage? Or oh, no, yeah. after the after party? No, no, on stage at oh. the end of, in front of thousands of people. Oh. Andy, Fris Andy Frisella speaks. Okay. Me and, me and the muscle walk out. We're doing closing remarks. And I'm about to introduce Aoki. And the, you can see the video. He creeps up from behind me and just nails me. <laughs> Dang, I couldn't see. I missed that. We, we left right as Andy was ending because of uh, the flight. Yeah. Dang. And I'm trying to pull the cake out and I can't because my hands have cake on it. So I'm not getting the cake out. The security guard had to like come walk me off stage. I'm like, I can't see you. Because I'm blind. <laughs> I'm going to fall off stage. <laughs> Literally had no idea where I was. That's funny. <laughs> How did um, you become friends with Aoki? From poker. He was just a poker guy too. 2008, I played a poker game at his house oh. with, with Mini-Me. Remember Vern Troyer? Um, Joel Madden. And like we made this video together of like poker. Some poker friends went, some poker pros went. And then these like musicians and TV guys were there. Yeah. And uh, we played this house game in like 2007, 2008. So yeah, we've been friends for a long time. And then just kind of, then I made him one of the face of the poker site and just kind of went from there. Yeah. No, he's a cool dude. Yeah. Cause uh, once again, I was, I was telling, I was saying this earlier, but like, you know, you're the ultimate connector. And so that was the first time I met him at the house party. And, you know, just like your endorsement um, is strong enough to like build relationships because you were like, Hey, you got to meet Ryan. He yep. lives in Vegas. He's doing some cool things. So then after I DM would him and I was like, dude, it's good meeting you. Here's my number. And then he texts me, Hey, it's Steve Aoki. Great meeting you, dude. Yep. And then I'm like, all right, <laughs> like, he's just, he's just a cool dude. Yeah. When you think about how many millions of people hit him up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's, it is like kind of crazy. Um, that I would just say you're always like one connection away from somebody yeah. and you're what I would call like a master connector where it's like, yeah, you, you're probably that one connection away from almost anyone. It, the butterfly effect of that is, you know, let's say you guys now become friends. You mm -hmm. guys, you end up going to one of his shows. He comes on the podcast. He comes to an event, like yeah, stuff yeah. happens. That butterfly effect to me that is what I love. Yeah. Right. And it, it stems back to me as that initial thing, but I'm not, I don't gain anything from it outside of like the, whoa, that's cool. Fulfillment. Yeah. And 
watching that happen on a consistent basis over and over and over because throwing these events, throwing these it events. It just happens all the time. Making group chats, making group chats, introductions. And so I just love the butterfly effect of what happens if you're like, hey, I'd love to get A-Rod to speak in my event. I'm like, oh yeah, here's A-Rod. And then he speaks to your event. And then yeah. he inspires people. And like yeah. that butterfly effect to me is so cool. And I try to do that every day. Yeah. I forgot who you did that with for me. I, I had posted about something. I was like, I need X, Y, Z. And then this was on Instagram. I didn't even ask you. Yeah. And then like- the Group chat just happens. Yeah, like out of five minutes later, <laughs> hey, this is so-and-so, this yeah. is Ryan. Yeah. I was like, damn, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I mean that, that it, and that's why you are where you are. So I guess my, um, my thought is, I mean, if you're going to go all in on events and all in on relationships and everything else, I mean, we, we're, we're talking about like, yeah, the end result is great. You're, you're going to get like all this byproduct stuff and you're going to get fulfillment. But I guess on the business perspective, is there anything that you're really looking for? You know, like, like raising capital, like new startups, investments. What are you looking for? So raising capital for companies, we do three to six million dollars per round into companies that do two, two to 20 million in sales. Okay. That's, that's called the elevator syndicate. It's free for people to join. We raised $44 million last two years in this exact model, three to six million bucks at a time. And so that now can compound because now I have live events every single week or two. Mastermind, there's four masterminds now. So four masterminds, that means you've got 12 to 16 events a year that are masterminds, you know, 100 to 300 people at a time. Spire tours, two to 3,000 people at a time. Yeah. The arenas are 5,000, 7,000 people at a time. And so that compounds where I'm gaining new and new, more and more people to hopefully join the elevator syndicate that are credit investors that then will invest in deals. Same time, I have my charity events. So if I get all these new people, new followers, new humans into my world, I'm like, hey, I'm throwing Thanksgiving food drive or hey, I'm doing these free tipping dinners. You should do tipping dinners too. And then everybody's like, yeah, we'll do tipping dinners. And then What I is see a tipping dinner? So we do this, it's called the $100 tipping club. Okay. And so I post these videos where I go to cities and I get a bunch of entrepreneurs and friends together and we all surprise the waitress and the staff with a hundred bucks each. Sometimes we do a thousand bucks each. That's the thousand dollar club. Okay. And so we'll surprise them with ten thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, two grand, eight grand, thirty grand sometimes, depending on how many people are there. And so we now at events say, Hey, will you guys commit to doing a hundred dollar tipping club event before 2023 is over? And you'll get hundreds of people to stand up and be like, Yes, I'll do it. And then that weekend they start tagging you of them having eight friends or 20 friends or 30 friends together, chipping in a hundred bucks each and then surprising the waitress. Got it. And so hopefully you guys are listening, throw a hundred dollar tipping club event, a dinner in your city. And all you do is get your friends together, have between four and 30 people show up and then you pitch in a hundred bucks each or whatever amount you're comfortable with. And at the end of the meal, you surprise the waiter, the waitress or the staff or all of the above. If you got a couple grand and have them split it and that's it. Yeah. No, I love that. It's I'm going to do that. I'd never even heard of that. It's fun. Yeah. So you're, you're throwing different styles of events, right? I mean, you got charity events, you got this elevator nights, you've got three day events. This, this one we just did in the arena was like yeah. the longest <laughs> event of all time. 12 hours straight. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I don't know about this setup, dude. Yeah. This, this, uh, it's 12 hours again next time too. I just, I don't have a choice. Why don't you have a choice? You, you have a choice at everything. Why don't you have a choice? <laughs> like, do, you don't, because like, I guess for me, every wealth con, I'm always like, dang, dude, we could have did that way different. We yes. could have did that way better. So I guess this was your first like 7,000 person one like this in a one day. Like, what what are you going to change? So there'll be less speakers. Okay. Um, yeah. Because people didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. There'll be less speakers. There's less panels. Um, there's still panels, but there's less of them. And um, the breaks are longer, the dinner break and lunch breaks longer. So we're just fixing some of the flow parts of it, but it is still 12 hours because I do have a lot of speakers and there's some speaker needs, we're having a, a big name that we're getting that needs more longer time. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that are coming back uh, to speak again. And so just the math of how many people are involved, it's going to be long, but it's also effectively a two or three day conference all stacked into one day. Yeah. And so that's part of it. And, um, We'll also make it clearer this time. Not everyone knew it was going to be 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll be clear about that. And they'll know we didn't do the lineup publicly last time because 28 speakers, there's a lot of moving parts. I didn't want to, people to see if there's changes. Yeah. This one is less speakers. And so it'll be much clearer. I will, I will post the the timeline publicly. The itinerary so people know. and all yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. That's good. 
And then um, that'll be in Utah again. Same venue at the Maverick Center. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do more than 7,000 because we'll open up the rafters and the nosebleeds this time. We didn't want to last time. Um, but then once we were there, we realized you could actually see pretty well from the nosebleed sections. You can still see clearly and the way the screens were, you can still see it. And because I'm adding a, a household name celebrity to this event and a humongous speaker at the same time, I, I expect us to go more than 7,000. Let me ask you this, actually. That's a good thing I've been thinking about. So now holding these wealth cons, obviously we get speakers and everything else. And what I have personally found is, to me, it, it just hasn't really affected ticket sales one way or the other. You know, having so-and-so or so-and-so, like that you might see a slight, you know, variation, but I don't know. I guess I, I don't want to say they're coming for me, but they're just coming for like, like now that it's building brand and sure. recognition, like it's just is what it is. So adding a celebrity or a house of name business person or a big name athlete, for example, it does add some mystique to events. Um, it is not necessary for the actual content. Like it's not like you're having an epiphany from Mike Tyson or from yeah. Floyd Mayweather or from house of name celebrity. Maybe they will and they'll drop some nuggets, but ultimately there is some mystique factor to it. The other part for you as the event hoster is, there may be some celebrity that is worth you paying to, for you to build a relationship with them. Right. So you're like, hey, I want to book A-Rod and spend $150,000 to $250,000, which is, may sound crazy, but now you get into business with him because he owns 19,000 real estate units. Yeah. Right? And you, you're like, hey, dude, I do a ton of real estate and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, shoot. And then you might want to build a relationship with a certain character. Like, oh, I want this guy from Shark Tank or I want Damon John or I want Mark Cuban. You might spend 100K, 200K, 300K that might impact your financials for the event. But now you have this relationship with that the long term that person. Uh, the other thing is there are certain characters that do move ticket sales. Gary V, David Goggins, like we track it in our ads for Aspire Tour and some of the other events. We know what ads converting at a higher rate based on who the face is. So Sarah Blakely, Gary V, David Goggins type characters, they're going to move ticket sales. Mm. And we can physically see it. We can see the ad conversion rate, the click through rate, et cetera. And there are certain characters that definitely move take more tickets. I guess um, maybe I'm, um, I have to get out of my own head about it, but on one side of things, I'm like, well, dude, I mean, Gary Vee speaks at so many events that like, it's not, I guess, as special. And so the math of it, when you see it, you, it feels that way, but most of these events only have a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people. So you're like, oh my God, he spoke at 30 events. That's a hundred thousand people. That's all. Yeah. There's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so it's really rare for someone to actually have gone and seen him even though it seems that he is omnipresent and he is everywhere, most of these events are small, medium-sized events. And so the sheer math of it, that's also when people are like, oh no, this event is the same weekend as your event. What's going to happen? There's 1,800 people at their event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's hundreds of millions of people in this country, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. people really have these fears. It happens all the time. Oh no, I oh, double booked. Same exact weekend as WealthCon is this event, Thrive. Yeah. You guys have 1,000, 2,000 people each. Yeah, there's still great. Yeah. But mathematically, it's irrelevant to the, yeah, society. The totals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because right now, I didn't even know. Because we don't even look. We just book what's good for us. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, like the same week as EXP Con, mm -hmm. and so you know, like biggest. Well, I don't know if they're the biggest yet, but you know, one of the biggest real estate brokerages yep. here in Vegas. You know, they're both in Vegas, and so I have a lot of people who are like, "Yeah, like I'm in town. Know, yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm gonna. I'm thinking about just like hopping over a different day and like whatever. <laughs> sure, <laughs> do what you want to do. Yeah." I know we're going to be way better than a realtor event though. <laughs> <laughs> a realtor event's got to be the most boring event in the world, yeah. but that's just my opinion. But uh, no, it's cool, man. Like I, I, I totally see the value in it. I see the long-term brand building. I see the, the, the content benefit of getting For all sure. that content. Um, you know, it just seems like a great thing. So like, okay, we're, we're doing it at a high level. How would somebody get started? Um, hosting a free event. You know, that's what I did with Elevator Nights hosting a free event in your local town, especially if you can do a niche. Like okay. in, let's say you love cars or you love fashion or you like fitness or you like real estate or you like the stock market or crypto, throwing an event in a niche and then just getting a meetup together the first time and you hosting it and maybe getting one or two or three speakers and they'll come for free. You all of a sudden have like some street cred and some personal brand that happens. And I used to throw these free crypto meetup events at like the W Hotel Lobby. I spent nothing. I had no open bar. I had no catering. I had no microphone. I just like, hey guys, we're going to talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
<laughs> meet, me in the, meet me in the lobby at 7 p.m. at the W. Bring your wallet. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> they weren't even buying anything from me. They were just like, anyways, and I'd have three, yeah. 400 people show up. Wow. From nothing. Yeah. With like five days notice. Yeah. And then I did it again. I did one for cannabis and then I did one for crypto. I did one for real estate. I did one. You just picked these different niches. Yeah. It's my excuse to all of a sudden like get networking and popularity in a niche. Got it. I'm not even in the cannabis space. I don't even do much in real estate I'm yeah. outside of investing with friends. Like I don't, yeah. I don't own any real estate outside of my investments. Um, you do own the farm though. <clears throat> I do have a big ass ranch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's insane. Yeah. Tell me about the ranch. Uh, it's 26 acres. <laughs> There's 188 animals. <laughs> they eat a lot. <laughs> I spend 9,200 bucks a week in hay. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's. Why did you do that? So. You're not married, right? I am. You are married. Yeah. How do you travel so much? Okay, we got to talk about it. Different. Let's <laughs> we'll get into that in a sec. But let's let's talk about the the farm first. So the ranch, the ranch was because of my wife. She loves animals, and that's part of why I did it. Um, and then I built Operation Black Site. There's like a military training there, also like yeah. op military obstacle courses and shooting ranges. I have event center spaces to host mastermind events. I have a wedding venue, an ATV course, basketball courts, pickleball. So I have things that I've always wanted something like this. And then it just kind of evolved as I as I got it like a couple years ago. And then the wild jungle, W-Y-L-D, the wild jungle is where I brought the real Tarzan. He lives there. Mm -hmm. and he gets 200 million views a month mm -hmm. making animal content. And so <laughs> the whole left side of the ranch, eight acres of it is dedicated to animals. And that's where the 188 animals and growing are there. Um, and so, but it's not open to the public. We'll do private tours. We'll do private events and things like that. You don't have to get like a permit. For certain animals, yes. Okay. Um, the property already had permits for zoning for a petting zoo and things like that. Oh. Uh, um, and based on the, the acreage, it had also, once you're over five acres, you can do X, Y, Z. When you're over 10 acres, you can do X, Y, Z. Got it. And then certain animals, like we're waiting on two giraffes. We have to wait for our permits for that. We're waiting on kangaroos. We have to have permits for that. Jeez, dude, this is um, going to be nuts. I can't wait. <laughs> I, can't. <laughs> I, I will leave less once those kangaroos. What, what is the upkeep every month? 100, 155000 a month. 155,000 to run the zoo. Yeah. And they are hungry. Does, uh, <laughs> no does matter it, what you do. Is no it a loss leader? Yeah. Yeah. I don't make that. We don't make any, we're near that kind of money there. If I, <laughs> if I do, if I do, when I do weddings, I can make good money. Right. All right. I got to ask a question. Like, what do you do that's profitable? Cause we're talking about like all these loss lead. Like how the heck are you affording all these loss leaders? Um, the masterminds are profitable. The, some of the live events are profitable, not the charity events and the yeah, other yeah. nights. Um, I have a lot of investments. I've done 43 investments. Yeah. Um, we have the Everbull chain. I own 17 of the stores of the Everbull stores and then I'm building a bunch more of those. Uh, but the social media agency is, you know, my my day job. Got it. And speaking, I speak at over 100 events a year. So. Do you, did you make a big nest egg from like the public company or that wasn't really a factor in all this other stuff? Um, I made money along the way from that. Yeah. Then the poker site did really well. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. That, that did really well. Uh, Cause I only had five employees. So I had no overhead. <laughs> it was just <laughs> making a lot of profit. Yeah. And then along the way, I just, I've had some exits from my investments. Got it. We sold sneaker con to eBay. Um, we sold, you sold sneaker con. Yeah. The sneaker con convention. Okay. So we have, um, how much did, are you allowed to say how much you sold? No, no you can't. E eBay is very strict. Yeah. Um, and so I've had some exits. Some companies went public. I was one of the first investors in a company that went public. I sold all my shares in that right before the wedding. Um, the wedding was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get married? Uh, 2018. 11, 11, 2018. Okay. Um, so how does your wife deal with you just always being gone? It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotten a lot harder now, especially this summer because of the events deal I did with Aspire Tour. Yeah. So I went from leaving like 150 nights a year to now probably 250 nights a year. Yeah. So it's really tough from that perspective. She does go with me. Like she was there at Salt Lake City. Okay. Um, at the Maverick Center, she was up on stage on the charity panel. Um, but most of the time I go places for one day and there's no point for her to go. And, but I might go three, four, like I was in seven cities the last nine days. Mm. She wasn't going to go to that. Right. Yeah. So since Salt Lake, I haven't seen her. So luckily um, she's occupied. She has her own podcast, her own large following on social media. She manages influencer campaigns. She does a lot of fitness content. She's got a couple million followers. Like she is her own thing. Um, so I would suggest if you are traveling a lot, if your wife or husband or significant other is at home, they're going to watch you and sometimes they could resent you Yeah, because you're out there living life and traveling the planet and doing meetings and conventions and conferences or whatever it is that you're doing 
in your space. One, you have to have very clear communication. Two, update them so they're part of your world. Uh, three, do whatever you can to get home and spend more time and more quality time, mm -hmm. which I'm not that great at because I look at my phone a lot. And so I have to like yeah. forcefully put my phone away um, because it can cause conflict, resentment, et cetera, while you're out there living it up and they're at home with two kids or five kids or whatever they're doing at home. Um, you need to have open communication about those things. And when you can make them a part of it, do that. And the last thing I'll say is also they have to have something going on in their world. Otherwise they're going to really just like, yeah. Attached to what you're doing. Do you guys have kids? No, not yet. Yeah. They have a lot of animals. <laughs> yeah. You have 188. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I, uh, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because I don't even like leaving Vegas. So like, I'm kind of the opposite. I don't like speaking at other people's events and stuff unless, um, they're friends or it's like a very big opportunity. Sure. Um, but that's why I hold all my events in Vegas. I'm just lazy, dude. Like I'm just trying to it. go back home at night. And yeah. I love it. Be with my family. But you know, we have three kids now and they're young. And so that is my wife's full-time thing. Yep. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but, uh, if I had children, I would leave a lot less. Yeah. Like I would, a lot less. Yeah. That, that for sure changes yeah. things. So I'm like, yeah, like my wife and I kind of have like an understanding that I can leave like once or twice a month. You know, and that's kind of like the quota. Yeah. Because it's just like anything more than that, like I don't need to do it. Sure. You know, so at that point, why am I doing it? Yeah. Because I can build something great here. Yep. I'm just doing it because I'm on this mission, this charity mission of saving the world. Yeah. And I'm mentally obsessed with it. <laughs> and so I'm willing to be in, fresh off the plane to come see you. I'm fly out tomorrow night. Yeah. I fly to three different cities the next two days. Like crazy. I'm I'm on this mission. And it's it's extra tough timing wise now because it's working. The podcast yeah. podcast is number one, toy drives is number one, the masterminds are highest end mastermind business conferences are big, like all the things are clicking. And you can't lose momentum. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm just I'm obsessed with the game of it, not the money part of it. The game of it is like it's working. People are doing more charity. I'm opening more Everbowls. I'm opening more card stores. I'm doing more of the like I'm doing more and more of this. I'm not trying to do new things, I'm trying to do more and more of the same. And so I have this obsession and addiction to it that if I sat at home, I would be resentful. Oh yeah, for sure. Right now. Not yeah. later. Not later. Yeah. I, I think it um once again, like it, it goes back to what you just said. Like I think once you enter a different stage with kids and everything else, you you just kind of like have just different desire. Or once you hit the goal, whatever the goal is, mm -hmm. you know. But also you um you got married later in life. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I don't even know what that's like because we got married super young. So like we've built everything together. Like, right. And so it's just, a, it's an interesting dynamic for entrepreneurs who are kind of like, I want to grow, but then I also want to spend time with my family. Sure. And it's a big decision. Yeah. There's, there's so many variables that go into it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't want to say like, <clears throat> I envy people who don't have kids or anything because I freaking love being a dad. Sure. But it's like, now when I see people who don't have kids, I'm like, Dude, you have no excuse for not crushing it. Just freaking go for it. Go work, do yeah. your thing. Right. Like there's no excuses. Cuz kids kids change it a lot. Yeah. So, but yeah, dude, I'm I'm excited for just everything you're doing. I'm excited to be a part of it, you know, it at each other's events and all the mutual people, you know, the podcast, the masterminds, dude. I mean, it's all in alignment with what I'm doing as well, so I'm just um excited to you know, learn from you and pick pieces of what you're doing and try to just apply them the best I can, man. So, um, just really stoked that, uh, we've gotten to know each other better. Happy to be here. I'm excited for WealthCon. It's going to be good. Yeah. Really it's going to be great. Yeah. So guys, if you want to learn more about what Dan's doing, what's the best way to find you? So all my social media is the same. It's just at Dan Fleischman across every platform. Go check him out on Instagram, all the platforms. Go check out his podcast, Money Mondays. I, I did an episode, which I will link to down below. You guys can check out and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Peace. The higher you move in your commitment to being the best in the world, the smaller your margin of error. Most of the people I work with know how to handle the weight of failure. They do not know how to handle the weight of success. As long as you're comparing 